It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome back to the show. Today's show, we're not broadcasting live from Atlanta like we typically do. We're right here in Vegas, uh, which is the center of the universe for returns and all things reverse logistics this week at least. Uh, The Reverse Logistics Association Conference and Expo. You can probably hear the lively background uh, (laughs) uh, noise of folks sharing best practices and networking, but uh, it's taking place right here. We're in day, I guess, day one, right? Yeah, technically. Yesterday was day day zero. zero, yeah. Um, but we're excited to be interviewing a wide variety of thought leaders throughout our programming here. Uh, today's episode, we've got to give uh, a quick shout-out to our today's sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you, our audience, by ReCommerce. ReCommerce Group Industries is an industry leader in return product management, return center services, remanufacturing, reprocessing, repairing, and recycling of consumer products. You can learn more over at ReCommerce Group, Inc., Dot com. Big thanks or, to those folks. Or at the booth right next door. That's right. Which is where, that might where, be easier. Where they're located, yeah. If you're here, <laughs> We're go next have, door. I think we're going to have a lively uh, conversation this morning. A uh, quick programming note. Of course, you can find our podcast wherever you get your podcast from, including uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. That's right. Uh, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Yeah. Uh, as you've already heard at, in the first two minutes of this episode, I'm joined by my fearless co-host, serial supply chain tech entrepreneur, chronic disruptor, trusted advisor, Mr. Greg White. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing great. All things considered, first of all, we got to go see Beatles Love. It was nice. awesome. Last night, and it was amazing. What a physical spectacle that, mm. you know, all of those Cirque du Soleil, Cirque du Soleil shows are. I didn't great. know where to look. It, yeah, you know, there's there 27 it, things going on at once. So it was obviously about the acid trip days <laughs> of the Beatles because it it actually physically felt like I mean what I perceive one to feel like. Yes, <laughs> sensory overload. Yes, that's, let's go with that. Yeah, with great music <laughs> and the the, the the team, the the actors. Yeah, are, man, just incredible. Yeah, all so, athletes. You yes. know, I mean, it's just it's a very impressive. Yep. Uh, event. So. Yep. Um, but. Uh, we're going to upstage that with our first guest here today. That's right. He's so, going to be doing some backflips. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll get right on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's welcome in Tevin Taylor uh, with FedEx. He serves as managing director at uh, FedEx Supply Chain. Tevin, how you doing? I'm doing well today. Great to have you. Um, and what I really liked about Tevin as we were building out our interview schedule, mm-hmm. he was one of the few, if not the only, that said, hey, I'll take the earliest slot you had while in Vegas. I love that. It makes our, our job easier. Yeah. I didn't sleep last night. I, <laughs> qu- I questioned his judgment, but he's clearly alive and well. This yes. Morning. The alcohol gets out of the system pretty quick for me. <laughs> That's good. Uh, my, That's my, good. My, my kidneys do a good job for me. So Excellent. You're in great physical shape. <laughs> yes. So if our audience can't tell, I think we're going to have a very lively uh, conversation, and fun conversation here today <laughs> talking about some uh, serious topics. But, but you know, for starters, uh, Tevin, you know, we really want to uh, get a sense of who you are, the person, sure. before we talk shop and, and before we talk your your professional journey. Um, but tell us, where did you grow up? And give us an anecdote or two from your upbringing. So, grew up in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, uh, fifth generation Texan. Uh, proud to be Texan. Yep. Except for cowboy fan and all that. But uh, you're coming back. Uh, I'm <laughs> got they got to <laughs> secure right? Dak, and you're coming back. Yeah, that's my theme for the Cowboys. Yeah, I like that. Huh? I'm a diehard Texas A&M fan as well. So mm-hmm. that's go Aggies. Oh. Yeah, I'm third generation Aggie or but Gigum Aggies. Gigum Aggies. Aggies. There you that's go. Right. G- Gigum Aggies. Um, you know, I, I uh, growing up, I was just fascinated with airplanes. Fascinated with aeronautics and which which airframe stands out? Which for you for me is the B seventeen. B-17 as a kid, I was just, I loved it. You think that's what I'd like? Because my dad was at Lockheed, and it's all about military airplanes. I loved the F-16 growing up, mm. but flying, believe it or not, was the MD-80. 
Really? Okay. I love the MD-80. I don't, the way it felt, the engines on the back, it was just, and the wings are flapping. It looked like it's going to fall apart. But <laughs> and I every lo- time you landed, it wants to yaw, right? Oh, there's so. no doubt. And you look at the wings, and those things were in service for 45 years, mm. and the paint was chipping off. It, I just, <laughs> it, but you never heard about them crashing. Mm. I mean, honestly, yeah. if you yeah. looked at the MD-80, it was a solid airplane. It's a great mm. short haul bird. Yeah. McDonnell Douglas. Yes. Manufactured right. plane, right? Correct. Um, so, so fascinated with aerospace and aeronautics and aviation. So, what, what, how did you act on that? How did that lead to your uh, personal journey? So, in high school, I was uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough to date someone that uh, her dad was a recruiter at UPS. Okay. And I said, I love airplanes. I'd love to go load airplanes. <laughs> and he said, Well, I'll get you a job at the ramp. So, <laughs> I went out in high school, started loading airplanes at DFW um, there on the West Runway, and then went down to Texas A&M and started loading trucks. Mm. So the cool thing about loading trucks in College Station is it's such a small town. They don't have enough volume Mm. to justify a full schedule for part-time. So you'd load the truck, and then you'd wash all the brown trucks. So (laughs) every day we wash those trucks. And it was it was a, it was an interesting time, but uh, less than glamorous. Than less than pilots. glamorous. There's no doubt. I'd rather load a truck than wash a brown truck. <laughs> but, but what did, was that? Then was that your first real real job uh, working down there? I wish it was. No, um, I started. Uh, I worked at a vet's clinic when I was 12 years old in a small town called Madisonville, Texas. Um, my grandmother lived down there, and she thought it'd be good if I went to work. You know, mm. it's child labor. Yeah, you know, right. Taking care of castrating bulls. You know, taking care of all sorts of animals out there in the country. Wow. Yeah, it was it was a good time. So I did that. Then I roofed houses from the time I was 13 until I turned 16. Then I started lifeguarding. I started doing – I did all sorts of odds and ends. But I, I you know, I learned that logistics is definitely where, where I wanted to be. Mm. Just, you know, the whole airplane thing fascinated me. And I, I dreamed about being a pilot, but I was mm. too cheap to actually pay for pilot's <laughs> lessons. So – and it's a true story. My best friend growing up, uh, he and I would go fly together – he, he paid for it. I wasn't getting credit for it. He's a pilot for Southwest Airlines now, mm-hmm. so I look back and I go, "Shoulda, coulda, didn't." So mm-hmm. instead, I'm at FedEx. But are you are you still fascinated with with airplanes? Do you still read about it or, or or spend time at airports and flying and planes and stuff? Well, you, you know the, the the neatest thing about airplanes when you're younger, you're too ignorant to understand what they really do for a global economy mm-hmm. and for the world. You know, the fascination I have now is you just look at what they do to connect the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And Fred Smith, my founder and chairman back in the 70s, saw the benefit of connecting the world and connecting commerce. But, um, you know, it's got a huge benefit. But then you start seeing not only that, Mm. but what it does, you know, when it's cut off like this coronavirus. Yeah. Mm. We cut off flights to China, yeah. and you start seeing commerce. I mean, literally, the global economy is so connected, and aviation is really what's done it. You know, obviously, the next uh, you know industrial change we're going to see is really digital. But you know, the airlines and logistics have a lot to do with what we're doing with moving goods and people. Absolutely. Uh, and so we're going to talk about uh, FedEx's role in that and other things here in just a minute. Before I turn the pass baton over to Greg, uh, let's talk. The Reader's Digest version. You kind of talked about some of your sure. early hard work uh, yep. uh, jobs and roles that you were in. Kind of give us a, a real quick progression to your current role. So, you know, out of school, obviously I was in operations for UPS. I started at FedEx as an IT guy. Okay. So my degree was management information systems because, you know, mm-hmm. I was one of those kids that went to college and I looked at the career center and said, what job's the highest paying and the most demand? <laughs> management information systems. It was great, great money. The problem is, as you can tell, I like to talk and do things. Mm. I was very much a disruptor in the IT department, meaning I disrupted all the programmers. Right. <laughs> so they started flying me around, um, having me design the software, test the software and operations. And I happened to be in Nashville one night, and I was implementing some software solutions. And there's a whole bunch of Dell people walking down the way. And they said, are you the sales guy? Because I was talking to him, I said, "No, I'm the IT guy." And they kind of shrugged at me. And <laughs> Even so, at Dell, yeah, that, they made that presumption. Yeah, right? they, 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 they <laughs> kind of awkward for them. So then, all of a sudden, the sales team came. It was all these different people, and one of the groups was called FedEx Solutions, and it was run by a guy named Tom Schmidt. Mm. You've interviewed before. Yes, he runs Ford Air. Ford Air, yeah. yeah. So Tom Schmidt started this group called FedEx Solutions, and it was our consulting group. And they started talking to me, and they're like, "Okay, you like to talk. You know what we do. You really." or value selling to us what you're doing. <laughs> so next thing you know, I got a job offer two weeks later, went into an engineering role, solutions, um, and then ironically a headhunter called me, and I left the company and went to Brinks. Okay. 
and I got into sales there, national sales. And the reason I did it is I, I did not want to leave FedEx. Love FedEx, great company, but I couldn't go into sales from an IT solution mm. standpoint. You had to kind of go back to, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're really good about career progression. Um, but did multiple roles at uh, Brinks and got to executive leadership um, and then realized, you know what, things have changed there, time to go back to FedEx. Mm -hmm. So I went to FedEx and I was a global account manager for Dell, managing their worldwide business. And a small company called Genco called me up <laughs> and uh, started bugging me. And I say called me up. Art Smuck, who was their, their CEO, mm -hmm. and he was our CEO of FedEx Supply Chain. I saw him in Ireland, saw him again in Hong Kong. And you're going to interview Tom Marr today. Mm -hmm. So Tom's team was giving us a I think he knows award. more about our program than we <laughs> yeah, do, Greg. I'm right. impressed. I put, I put the schedule together, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so they were giving us a supplier award, and I was sitting at this table, and Jeff Clark, who's the EVP at Dell, and some others were at the table. And there's 500 suppliers there, but I happened mm. to be sitting next to the CEO of Jinco, And when they were giving me the award, and I knew we were getting the award. It was a FedEx award. I handed Jinco my phone, Art Smock, and said, here, take a picture. Someday maybe you'll get one. Just being funny, right? <laughs> yeah. For some reason, he liked that, so he took, takes me up to the 110th floor bar later on and said, I want you to come work for Genco. So I went to Genco, and I was doing high-tech sales, and six months later, we got acquired by FedEx. <laughs> so I'm back at FedEx. I love FedEx. Not leaving right. unless they make me. Right. Yeah, right. So it's, it's a great company. Third time's a charm. It, it is. <laughs> well, and quite honestly, the reason I went to Genco is because – Every time I talk to customers about what we did at FedEx, it was all transportation related. And we'll go into what I do at supply yeah. chain. But I loved what Genco offered. FedEx acquired that for a reason, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about that here mm -hmm. in a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so I, I have to comment on this, and that is you must have really liked loading trucks to get in to, to stay in the parcel and, and logistics industry, right? I hated the loading <laughs> trucks. Are you kidding me? I ripped a blood vessel in my elbow one day. They called me the elephant man because I literally was loading gateway computers, actually. Mm. Remember the oh, big yeah. boxes? Look Is like that the cows? ones that were cows? Yes. Cows, yeah. Right. So I'm loading, loading, loading. And so I played basketball in high school, and I landed on my elbows. And I just, I guess I tore tore the elbow pretty bad. So when I was loading, it just ripped the blood vessel. Oh, gosh. And I started feeling dizzy because, you know, in Texas in the summer, those trucks are like 120 degrees in the truck. Yep. And so I look at my elbow, and I just remember the guy next to me. His name is Hector. And Hector goes, <laughs> oh, holy crap, you look like. Elephant man. Can I say crap on this? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. We've heard worse. Bleep me, please, because yeah. I, I, my wife will tell you that I say a lot of words I shouldn't say. I wish I had a picture of Amanda killing her. She's going to be buying tickets to your next interview. Yeah, that's right. Oh, no, this, this, is, this, is, a, this is calm Dang. for me. I should have done the interview late at night. That yes, the, that's right. I hung out with the concrete people. Have you ever seen these guys here? Uh-uh. Uh -uh. they, they're fun, so. <laughs> I'll find you all later and take you to the concrete <laughs> conference they have here. Well, so right. there there have to be four people on the planet who don't know what FedEx does or maybe specifically what your division does. <clears throat> so for those four people, it may not be this, as many as four, actually, but for those four people, can give us an idea of what, what you're doing now with FedEx. I would say it's more like four billion people don't know what we do. Really? And, and this will shock you. So the acquisition of Genco by FedEx, which is now FedEx Supply Chain, was a remarkable acquisition. It was smart. But the FedEx brand is so associated with transportation. When I go to conferences, like RLA is different because Genco was a huge part of reverse mm, logistics. Right. So people know us here. But outside of this conference, if I go to CES or I go to other conferences, NRF, and I say I work for FedEx, and they're like, oh, are you a driver? I'm like, no. <laughs> I get that a lot. Hey. So. <laughs> no, I'm not a driver. How's that Kinko's thing working <laughs> <laughs> I get also, I mean, even here, somebody asked in the board meeting yesterday something about NRF, FedEx, which part of FedEx goes to that show? So what I represent and what we do is we're the 3PL of FedEx. Mm. Okay. So everything outside of really the transportation, the express, the ground, the freight. So reverse logistics, warehousing, fulfillment, repair. 3D printing, mm. critical inventory logistics, meaning spare parts in the field. So most people don't know that even exists at FedEx. Sure. Um, I was at a conference. It was a repair conference, and some people came up to me and saw my badge. They go, why would FedEx be at a repair conference? I go, we repair thousands of iPhones, Samsung devices, laptops. So when you go to our warehouse, you go, oh, my gosh, I never pictured mm. this being FedEx. Mm. Um, 
but really the mantra and what we do and what I love about my job is, you know, it goes back to the whole aviation thing. In the warehouse, we're connecting people and possibilities, and we're connecting the world with what we do. So I love, like I just had breakfast with a, a prospect, actually, not a current customer, but just walking them through the process of using a FedEx office mm. to drop off a return and giving you credit right there. Mm. And after that, I want to pick it, pack it, ship it, send it back to the warehouse. We're good to go. Mm -hmm. And they said, you can do that. I said, yeah. And the technology, my warehouse management system goes all the way into those retail FedEx office locations. My trucks are going to bring it to my warehouse. If I need to fulfill it back to someone else, I've got that network now mm -hmm. that I can handle. So, um, you know, you look very at... Very powerful. Very powerful. Very powerful. I mean, w we, if you look at what we do <coughs> at FedEx, 99% of GDP is within our reach, right? Um, you know, there's been some disruption in the market people are talking about. In every meeting I go to, people talk about that disruption. It's like, it's good disruption. It's, but it goes back to some trends we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but FedEx, my part of FedEx, people don't know. Yeah. Um, they don't know FedEx supply chain. They know the transportation side. But I will say the evolution of where we're going as a company, we're no longer just trucks and airplanes. Uh, we're warehousing. We're e-commerce. We're returns. We're repair. Um, if you need something 3D printed, you know, you think about the molds they make for teeth, you know, like the, the Smile Direct and things right. like that. Right. Those things you can 3D print and do it overnight and ship it to the end point where it wow. needs to go. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we uh, the insoles of shoes, you know, there there's customers we have where we 3D print. You, you literally take a phone and you image your foot, and we'll 3D. They'll send us the CAD drawing. We 3D print it, send it to your house. Never hit their factory, their warehouse. It's mass customization. It's mass customization. Yeah. Wow. So it's pretty cool. That's fantastic. So, I mean, I think we got a little bit of a picture of what, you know, some of the business problems you solve today. But you mentioned e-commerce, right? And I I have been in retail for a long time. I've sold technology into retail and e-commerce, and um, and I've worked with the big A um, in the past. And it's interesting to me sort of the dynamics of what's happening with e-commerce, right? I think people are seeking more and more independence and self-sufficiency, and it sounds like, if I'm reading you right, it sounds like some of those solutions are the kind of technologies that would ena enable a, a big or even a small brand to kind of stand on their own and have their own facilities on demand, right? Is that is that what your intention is to offer? It is. I'll answer that question, but I have to go back to the big A. Mm. <clears throat> I've never heard it called that, but that's now forevermore what I'll call it, the big A. Because <laughs> you can think of that in a couple of ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, you know, it, it's amazing to me that um, that company, which we'll just call the big A. Yeah, which will <laughs> remain nameless on this episode. <laughs> it, it's... Um, so many customers, so obviously y'all have seen in the news, right. we ended that relationship. Yep. Right. Um, it was very obvious to us that that was not a relationship anymore. Um, it was it was competition 100%, and all we were doing is helping them prop it up. Yep. Um, but we have customers that are deathly afraid of putting their business and their work there. Yes, we, we talk with several folks that don't want to mention and, and don't want to give any uh, heads up of what they're doing because I don't want the attention from this same organization. So Absolutely. We, we, we all see it. It is it, one of the strangest things. Yep. Um, but anyway, not to interrupt, but no, please go ahead. That's good. So so we, you know, as, as a FedEx supply chain group, our warehouses and what we do used to be dedicated. So you'd have a 300,000 square foot facility, let's say Dell or, you know, an AT&T, mm -hmm. someone like that. So you have these big warehouses and you do fulfillment and reverse logistics. But, you know, for the small, mid-sized customers, they didn't have an option. They could only go to that company. Or they go to a couple other companies that are out there that do similar work. Mm -hmm. um, FedEx actually has FedEx Fulfillment, which is multi-client. And it offers e-commerce. So you can plug in. Now, it's it's not customized, right. which is, those shops usually aren't. You plug your inventory in. You use a warehouse management system. Mm -hmm. Your orders drop to our facility. But now... You know, if Supply Chain Radio wanted to fulfill hats and T-shirts, which now I expect a commission, so That's I'll right. give you the good idea. <laughs> Merch. I could put that inventory in my warehouse. You could have it on your website, drop the order to us. We pick, pack, and ship it, fulfill it, and it's mm. all one rate. It's all within FedEx. I have no desire to back into your business right. and create T-shirts or figure out who your customers are. I'm going to work for you mm. and be your logistics partner. Mm. So we do have a solution for that. 
And furthermore, e-commerce has gone cross-border. Right. Mm-hmm. So we acquired a company down in Florida called Bongo, which mm-hmm. is now called FedEx Cross Border. So mm-hmm. we actually have the ability to do cross-border e-commerce shipments and offer customers a landed rate. So mm-hmm. you get you get that landed cost and you understand what it is. So not only am I going to control that, but I'm going to do the transportation, the warehousing mm-hmm. as well for you. So there are a lot of cool solutions that are coming up that FedEx is going to kind of piece together. So I like, and we, we talk about this uh, quite a bit, the, the ABA. We won't, we won't dive into that. But I love oh, come what on, I hear you, you describing <laughs> is how you are enabling firms of all sizes, of all ilks, the ability to be competitive and the ability, and also the, the ability to fo- – we all know how um, in, in, in entrepreneurial, especially small business ventures, the ability to focus in special and core competencies – and let go to things that are on the peripheral, and and, and know that that stuff will be done and, and executed very at a, at a high level. That's what I'm hearing. The things that you're doing to enable businesses of all sizes to move forward while focusing on on the core. Correct. In 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 the past, they were never even a target. Mm. You know, so when I was at Genco, nobody said, "Hey, go get that customer that does you know 100 orders a day." That mm-hmm. wasn't. I couldn't fill a building right. with it, right? <clears throat> so FedEx, uh, you know, obviously has the insight, and our chairman and our executives, they understand where the market's going. They understand what the customers need. So it enables. I had a customer call me the other day, and they were literally fulfilling stuff out of their garage mm-hmm. and needed a solution. So I said, "That's perfect. That mm-hmm. fits right into this model." Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you know, it, and you offer it. it it's behind, It's backed by the FedEx brand too. Mm-hmm. So some of the companies out there doing e-commerce and doing fulfillment, they're, they're new companies or I'll just say they don't have the, the trust in, in the brand of FedEx. So mm-hmm. it's, it's nice to have that. Customers are like, I had no idea you did it. Right. So, again, it goes back to the – There are a lot of market. people that don't know what we do, yeah. right? Right. We so all don't, don't know what we don't know. Well, when you, <laughs> when you think about short-term delivery, I think about an old slogan when it absolutely, positively has to be there overnight. We think that overnight or two-day delivery is such a an amazing revelation these days, but it, it's always been around. Been around. At, certainly for for right. business pro- documents and products that you guys have been doing for decades. Mm. So, well, don't forget when uh, when Fred wrote the term paper at Yale that he was going to set up a hub and spoke overnight network. His professor gave him. He always kind of goes between a C and a D. Yeah, I, I want to know the real story. I think he got a D on it. And the you pro- think he's trying to boost his grades? I think he might have tried to inflate at his this point, Wait, hold on. <laughs> no, he didn't. He, at this point? Fred did not do that. <laughs> yeah. At this point, I would think it wouldn't matter. It's right. more about the story. That's right. right. It's a good story, and it's a true story, but it's a fact uh, academia looked at him like, you don't know what you're talking well, about. Right. Nobody's going to pay for that service, right? Yeah. Which, you know, goes into where we are today. Overnight, people just think that's – it's not premium. People just expect it yep. now, right? Yeah. Which, by the way, going back to the e-commerce solution. Yes. Um, so if you look at how we set up our facilities, we don't just have one e-commerce facility. So if you have inventory of your supply chain hats and, and shirts, mm-hmm. 2% commission. Sure. Um, Two? One and a half. Yeah, one and a half. One and a half. <laughs> we're we're going to head to All right, one and a half to a threshold and there then two. How's that? We'll yeah. band it on volume. We'll yeah. figure this That's out, good. right? All right. That's good. So the, the neatest thing with this is it's not out of one facility. We want to put it in multiple facilities because we yep. have, you know, in Fontana we have a facility. In Indianapolis we have a facility. So the order drops to the nearest location to where you are. Yep. And we're starting there where we're just trying to reduce the ground transportation. But really where we're going to go to is it's it's no different than what you're seeing with same-day delivery, right? Right, right. Where if you really want it, there's a warehouse right down mm-hmm. the street. You know, the future of transportation is the truck's in route, mm-hmm. and it gets a signal, almost like an Uber signal, that says, hey, there's a T-shirt that we have to go pick up from the nearest warehouse. Pick it up, deliver, deliver it to you because yeah. mm-hmm. you want this supply chain radio mm-hmm. T-shirt so bad. Our our big question is Kansas City. We're really big in Kansas City. Do you think you can do same day delivery in Kansas City? Because that could be a game changer as far as your commission. Is there anything in Kansas City? Kansas City <laughs> Chiefs. <laughs> is, is that in Kansas or Missouri? I always oh, forget. No. <laughs> Both. Nice. Both. <laughs> so the Kansas side is the big side. I thought it was Kansas too. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm ignorant of that. <laughs> so we're going to switch gears here a little bit. We're, we're talking with the ever lively Tevin Taylor with FedEx, managing director of FedEx Supply Chain. On the Tell first interview the of day one, yeah. yes. Because um, a lot of what you're describing is, is future-looking. It's not about where we've been, and it's not like 1987. We pick on the 80s all the time. It's about what can we do, and let's do it. So let's look at the um, 
you know, the ever-evolving world of end-to-end supply chain, the circular economy, uh, what one or two issues or trends or topics really um, jump out at you and, and are topics that you're tracking more than others here lately? You know, honestly, the number one issue, this will shock you, it's labor. And it's not it's not qualified labor or technical labor. It's having enough labor. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, at FedEx and FedEx Supply Chain, attrition is not an issue. It's when you win a new business and you have to bring new labor in, mm. it's literally our heat maps have to go, where is there a labor force? Mm. And now where there used to be labor, there's none. Right. Yeah. Um, little side note story here. So my, my son worked at FedEx Express during college. He just graduated with a supply chain degree. Um, Where? What? what, what? U- University of North Texas. Oh, excellent. So mean Green. Yeah. Mean Green. Um, although he, he's going to get his master's at A&M because he, he? he wants the Aggie ring. So <laughs> That's good. Good, That's good awesome. kid. <laughs> Brought him up right. right? Well, a buddy of mine is, is a professor at the supply chain <coughs> school okay. at A&M. So we'll see, see about Maybe we can trade a p- half a point. For good grades. <laughs> Have a point. I'll do it. <laughs> Done. Done. <laughs> so uh, he um, he worked at FedEx Express, and I think he did that as a, you know, I work for FedEx Supply Chain, and I brag about FedEx, how great it is. So he went on his own. I didn't put, it, you know, no phone calls from me. It's a different opco anyway, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I wanted him to earn it on his own. He went and got a job. But then it was like, these hours are miserable. It's not a lot of money. It's like 15 bucks an hour, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like. But when we were kids, like I remember when minimum wage was four dollars and twenty five cents, and I made four fifty because yes. I did a step above what somebody else was doing. But it's amazing the labor force now is like I don't need that job. I can go flip burgers for fifteen bucks yeah. an hour and get a free meal. Mm. Um, so ironically, the labor pool is very difficult right now. So what do you do? Um, there's more automation, more robotics. You know, 10 years ago, robotics were just too expensive, and you'd have to customize every few years, and just the maintenance and support wasn't right. worth it. Mm-hmm. The labor pool being where it is today is actually going to drive more robotics in the warehouse. So you're seeing more auto stores, which is, you know, I don't know if y'all have seen auto store. It's a, it's a cube storage f- um, solution that essentially allows more uh, compression of space and people. Mm. So essentially, you for every four people you have, this solution will reduce it down to one. And mm. the reason why is because... The warehouse is turning into stop having people walk around. Right. Have robots bring the goods to the to pickers. The people. Yeah, to the right. people. So labor's huge. That's gonna that's gonna be an impact for for most businesses in our space for the upcoming years. Um, the second thing is is really um, believe it or not blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, so FedEx is FedEx Freight specifically has has really taken a, a leading position in looking at blockchain. So every shipment in our system gets about twenty five scans. And I don't know if you know this, back in the day, that was like, wow, it's too many. Have you ever mm. tracked a package? You're like, mm. I don't care. It's here and here and here and here and here. That's the old days, though. Yeah. Everybody cares. Well, they, they do. They care that it's on the front porch. Yeah. And they yeah. want to see a picture of the person doing it, right? <laughs> but that's just movement of a package. Blockchain in this shared ledger is going to give you the opportunity to really know everything about that. So, and I'm going to, I talk a lot about our chairman. I mean, I'm obviously very fond of him. <laughs> so, so Fred Smith back in 1978 said the information about a package is more important than the package itself. Mm. In 1978, he said that. Mm. So he really, he invested a lot in scanning technology. When we acquired RPS, they had barcode and scanning technology. That's boring. Everybody does that now. Blockchain is going to give you, you're going to know humidity factors, temperature. You're going to know where it is on the airplane. You're going to know like who touched it last. I mean, there's All that information is going to be shared on the blockchain, and it's going to tie to where it started in the warehouse, the invoicing. So you start putting all that information together and think of the power you could use with that detail. Mm. I mean, we're already seeing analytics with information people use with Google and stuff like that, but blockchain is going to make it for everyone. Mm. Well, and you can, I mean, you can confirm, let's say you you talked about temperature. You can confirm that your below zero product remained below zero throughout the shipment Mm. with blockchain. and. So if there's anyone out there that doesn't know what blockchain is, it's essentially an inalterable record. Mm -hmm. So once the entry has been made or once the confirmation has occurred or once the handoff has been recognized from me to you, that's inalterable. We can't change the time or the other data factors around that. And that is what makes it so important to people. And I think a lot of people don't exactly understand. They still tie it back to Bitcoin Mm. and that sort of thing. But that's (laughs) what what creates the legitimacy of... Even of those of those currencies, but it's applicable to this because yes. th- things like provenance and chain of custody and um, and you know performance in the supply chain 
from a time um, and efficiency standpoint, those become inalterable parts of the permanent record. So mm. there's not only so much you can track there, yes. you can learn a lot from it going forward. And here's sure. the, and, and I love what you're describing because it is more, it's about the information, the power of the information. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I heard a um, uh, industry executive put it in the simplest terms uh, probably a year ago. I've used this analogy before. But he said, he said, look, at it, in its simplest version, think of blockchain as like a mass email of 100, uh, 180,000 people even. And once you have a couple of reply alls, in short order, you've got 30 pages of emails. But unlike email software, imagine you can't go back to that second page of responses and change anything that was said or done or, or what transpired. That, at the core, is what blockchain is. And that was such an easy way that our 10-year-old can understand blockchain because, you know, while while it's become cliche, it, in a way that lean became cliche, right? Yeah. Because if it was, um, a lot of folks like talking about it, it was it was oftentimes mis, uh, misspoken, misrepresented. Of course, lean's been done the wrong way millions of times. Blockchain, everyone feels like it's got to be inserted in every conversation. But the folks that know, from at least from what, through 270 some episodes, right? In our, in our research, mm-hmm. it is going to shape and change the way that supply chain happens and, and retail happens and, and, and the world does business, right? Well, there needs to be more application of it, but you're right. It's become a buzzword. You know, one of my employees actually always says when he gets nervous and can't talk IT, he just says it's in the cloud. <laughs> um, That's another one, isn't it? He's, AI. He's here today, by the way. So if you see a guy, that, well, I won't say his name yeah. on there, but so. The coolest, like, let's let's simplify blockchain right. for reverse logistics. Yeah. So you have all these different companies, the retailers, big companies, and they all want to send returns back. Today, they all have to be integrated to the warehouse or to a logistics partner. If you really manage reverse with blockchain, think about a product. I receive a product, and I'm using the blockchain to disposition that mm-hmm. product now. So now instead of sending everything back to one warehouse, the the blockchain could actually help us disposition farther upstream. So at the point of pickup, or let's say somebody drops something off at FedEx office, FedEx office can print a label, and we know that product is a broken iPhone, and it get, we the blockchain tells us where mm. to send it. Mm. And it's not back to a central warehouse where it's going to be stuck for 15, 20, right. 30 days. It tells us to send it to the repair provider, and then the yeah. repair provider repairs it, and all this data is on the blockchain. Saves miles, saves footsteps. Transportation. Saves decision so, time. Well, not only that, but think about all the wasted, uh, nothing against my brethren right. in IT, right. but all that integration and customization of systems. Mm-hmm. If you, blockchain is getting to the point where what revolutionized transportation, going back to the aviation part, was containerization mm. and actually using containers for transport and understanding how to do that. So there's a standard, right? Right. Once you have a standard and you can implement that standard and everybody starts using it, yes. then there's the benefit. And you don't have all these disparate systems yes. and trying to figure out integrations, right? Well, so I, I know you've got about 20 people that want to talk with you today. Um, but really? let's, let's take this conversation <laughs> just a little bit one step further because two quick points. Uh, one is I'm curious after, after all the blockchain, um, you know, you have BIDA out there, which is a blockchain industry association. You have a lot of, a lot of folks that are becoming uh, – self-professed blockchain consultants i think the industry will will feel a lot better once there is some some uh protocols and standards in place and 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 some of these folks that are out there consulting with companies have some sort of certification that that standardizes things right i think that that'll make the industry feel better uh but number two one of the things you alluded to and one of the things that um uh sims spoke about yesterday Mm -hmm was the waste in uh, all these server farms that are out there. And because I, I mean, honestly, I'm, again, I might be thick-headed, but I didn't really think about this yet until yesterday of, of, of the waste of saving things, saving large files five times, because it, it may happen once or twice with all the video we take. Right. But all of the, the waste and the pressure that puts on, no wonder all these server farms are popping up everywhere, which consume massive amounts of natural resources, the, the um, we won't name the the social media platform, but there's a new huge investment uh, server farm in the southeast, and it's going to become one of the state's largest consumer of electricity, <laughs> like in the next year or two. Yeah, that's right. So, 
uh, I think that's what you were alluding to with some of the waste there. Speak a little more on that. Yeah, absolutely. I, and one of those server farms is right across from our facility. We got all nervous because the thing's the size of, like, I think it's like 10 football fields, mm-hmm. and it has 42 employees. <laughs> Wow. So yeah. we, we were worried about labor going over there, you know, because they're a famous <laughs> social platform. But at the end of the day, we're storing massive amounts of information. But when you do it from a disparate standpoint versus having a standard platform or standard mm. use or tool, it's just waste. And eventually what will happen is, you know, folks will start going, okay, spend $10 million on IT or start using the blockchain because it's 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 something that everyone has access to and you don't have to worry about. I mean, right now, the benefit of it and the reason Bitcoin became such a big deal is you really feel comfortable that someone can't hack it or do mm-hmm. something. Now, my theory on that is everything's hackable. If we create yeah. it, somebody can hack it, right? Yeah. But it's still a it's it's a record that at least everyone's speaking the same language. Yep. I mean, it's like if you got everybody on the globe would speak one language. Well, blockchain is that language. Yes, and blockchain needs that language in and of itself. You know, that, going back to that, you know, how can we ensure that that in this emerging technology that so many leaders do not quite understand how it works? And I'm, I'm including. I'm not. I don't know how blockchain works. I'll defer to the technology gurus, but also how to apply it. It's in the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. But you know, I think. I think we need a better um, – it, it, it'll, it'll have to come because blockchain is not you know, flavor of the month. It's here to, to revolutionize the industry. So, um, so much to dive into. Yes. I really appreciate you, your, your flexibility on some of the topics. So before, Greg, before we – Yes, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> before we make sure our listeners can, can get in touch uh, with Tevin here, Anything? I mean, we, we went through a lot there in the last 10 minutes. Yeah, Do you want to weigh in on? Well, you know, again, I think um, the accountability of blockchain is, to me, the most important aspect of it. And it probably can be hacked by somebody. Sure. There's at least one person or organization, whoever they are, <laughs> that, can, that can hack blockchain, and that's whoever invented the thing. But the truth is not everyone can, and and it has been proven – through the the cryptocurrencies to be very stable and secure and um and i think that's critical for us Mm. (laughs) you know one of my favorite applications of of blockchain would be political meetings i would love to see every (laughs) one of those meetings be recorded and accountable all of those handoffs think about all the backroom dealings we're talking about these days those kind of things if those could be it would be like the nixon tapes 100% 100% of the time Man. on that much I lo- des- love that disk idea. space. We're, we're going to have to circle back on that. There, I mean, there are lots of apps. That, sounds like, that sounds like Jerry Springer for radio. <laughs> 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 well, don't, don't you wonder, I mean, truthfully, I mean, it, and it's not just that, but mm. you wonder about what is going on out there that everything how, needs how, more how can anyone still spin anything these days, yeah. right? I mean, mm. it's mm. so accessible. Well, mm. I'm just glad we're adults because growing up, you know, think about, Everything's videoed, recorded. No kidding. I wouldn't have got away with anything. Man. I mean, you think about the things you did in your childhood. It's like, oh, gosh. Their technology has replaced Gladys Kravitz, right, in case anyone knows, still knows who that is. Bewitched. All right. Neighbor, oh, gotcha. The nosy neighbor gotcha. of Bewitched. I love that. What a, re- well, what a reference. Yeah. Okay. Real quick, weigh in on the value. Clearly, FedEx is a big supporter of the Reverse Logistics Association, which is a global organization. We're big fans with uh, uh, Tony Schroeder and his leadership and what they're doing to rejuvenate this organization against the backdrop of of how reverse logistics and returns and how you handle all of that mm-hmm. has got to be on the, on the short list of the most important topics in, in, in supply chain today. So so what value do you all see supporting RLA? Well, I'll say this. Tony's amazing. Yes, um, agreed. You don't see someone that gives so much passion and effort towards a cause. And mm-hmm. it's not – I mean – Unfortunately, with industry events, there are two types of people. There are people that make money, and that's what they're trying to do. And don't get me wrong. We're all in business to make mm-hmm. money. But Tony really believes in making reverse logistics better. He believes in bringing retailers, manufacturers, third-party service providers like ourselves into the mix because, I mean, every meeting, every industry event I go to with RLA – the education and the information that's shared, even the event last night, I don't know if y'all were at the little happy hour last night, going around and talking to the different customers that we have, it's a great opportunity for me to see my customers, the prospects, mm. but the cross-pollination. Mm. I mean, literally where you have, 
you know, I'll just say one computing customer and another computing customer, <laughs> and they're at the same table having drinks together. Love and it. it. And it, it's not, you know, there's no, you know, trade secrets or anything like right. that. But it's amazing to me because there's information shared that helps with solving for our problems to the day with reverse. And reverse is always changing. You know, I was on the elevator with somebody coming down, and it was a short elevator conversation. But they said, you know, fulfillment is clean and easy. Mm. They said reverse logistics is just a messy business. Mm. And it really is, but it's always changing. If you went to one of our reverse facilities, like on any given week, you'd see that we reconfigure and adapt to changes that happen. But events like this put us all together in the same room. And it's technology solutions. It's service providers. It really it, it lifts the knowledge base and the education level with everyone. Um, and it's just a great opportunity for us to kind of share best practices. Look at the agenda today. You have sustainability conversations. You have conversations on technology solutions. You have conversations on disposition and improvements in retail. Mm-hmm. But all those things that just listening to them, I literally get my dose in two days that I couldn't get in 12 months of talking to customers, right? Yeah. Um, so RLA is, um, it's good to see the strength. You know, they, they kind of hit a dip. Right. And that's when the, the different industry groups are kind of going in trying to set up their own events. Mm-hmm. But this really is about, it's a member-driven organization. Yes. So it's, it's exciting. It's good to be here. And, uh, you know, I've been part of it for six years now. And this is kind of the unknown. Like, you know, people, when my son first went through in our facilities, he goes, I had no idea FedEx did this. But people don't understand reverse. They think they return Absolutely. something and it just goes back. Magic the happens. In the, yes, right. magic. in the cloud. It's in the yeah. cloud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think an important part of what you're saying there is that even with all of the ca- capacity to get together online, actually physically getting together yeah. is is really really mm. important you mm. know we and we've that's actually been a theme of the f- of the first few interviews that we've done is you know you can accomplish over over a water cooler or maybe a drink or two um much more than you can accomplish in 10 or 20 emails yes right because yeah. you 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 can read the situation you can really you can really uh establish de- deconstruct it too yeah i mean th- yeah. that's when we have some of our most effective uh, uh, conversations when there's a little bit of trust, a little bit of rapport involved. Well, and this is a great podcast. This yeah. podcast is a great vehicle for that because Agreed. people get to know who Tevin is, right? Yeah. They get to know um, that he's a Roger Staubach fan, which yeah. is about all you need to know about you know, a person, a shame. in my opinion. You know, what's a shame is, is, is uh, Tevin is the first FedEx team member on our show. Is that right? Two hundred and almost we just eighty. Published, yeah, two hundred seventy-seven episodes. Yeah. Are you kidding? No, really? so you're groundbreaking. I like it. Well, well you, you, you get a T-shirt. Your we'll office is to too you. close to Browns, I'm sure. So <laughs> why don't you move from Atlanta to Memphis, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you more. <laughs> My wife loves Memphis. Yes. Good barbecue. Yes. Yeah, can't beat their barbecue. All right, so how can our listeners get in touch with you, connect with you? Yeah. What's, what's uh, some good avenues there? What's your phone number? <coughs> Mark Lipton. I get too Mark many Lipton. bot calls Not already. Not Scott, but Mark. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, honestly, the best way to, to contact me is LinkedIn. That, that's the best approach um, for now. Uh, obviously, there are resources online, but, um, you know, Tevin Taylor. I'm the only Tevin Taylor you'll find on LinkedIn mm, mm. from FedEx. Uh, very unique name. T E V O N Tevin. T E V O N yep. Taylor. So, my mom gave me the the best name on the planet. Yep. Everybody calls me Trevor, Kevin, Devin. It is amazing <laughs> yeah. how people can mess up your name, isn't it? No matter <laughs> what it is. I can give somebody my driver's license and they will key in Kevin. Like at Sam's, I went to Sam's to go get a new ID card. Didn't say a word. Just handed my driver's license. And they took Tevin and spelled K E V I N. I got my mm. new card. I'm like, <laughs> well, I had a professor at A and M one time. I said my name, and he goes, he called me Kevin. I said, no, it's Tevin. He goes, that's not a real name. <laughs> Which, by the way, my wife says too. <laughs> All Just right. go by T. That sounds That's cool. Right. T. T. Will work. LinkedIn. Uh, what a pleasure uh, chatting with you, yeah. Tevin Taylor, of FedEx Managing Director, FedEx Supply Chain. Uh, loved. The conversation we've had here today, kind of insights into some of the things that some of the aspects of what goes on in the wild world of FedEx that folks may not know about. But also, you're a very frank and forthright person. I love how you weighed in on some of the uh, you know things that are shaping the world of supply chain yeah. right now. Yeah. Appreciate so, being here. You bet. So stick tight for one second. We're going to wrap up here on the first episode of day one. Uh, Greg, very uh, very expedited uh, a version of our event calendar. Modex May 9th through 12th, Atlanta. Georgia World Congress Center. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, we'll take uh, a look. March, li- <laughs> March. Did I say May? I, I think I may say May. March 9th through 12th. Well, 35,000 of your closest supply chain buddies. Yes. Um, all spending time together. Materials handling. Um, distribution, fulfillment, facilities built right there on the show floor. Yes. It's like Tonka Toys for ge- for supply chain gear. And you can come check us out in person. We're going to be at MedEx yeah. streaming live throughout the four days. MedEx is also hosting our 2020 Atlanta Supply Chain Awards. Check that out. Nominations are open through uh, February 15th. Uh, and Christian Fisher, President and CEO of Georgia Pacific, is speak is our keynote at yep. that event. ModexShow.com, free to attend, by the way, um, for more information on that. Atlanta Supply Chain Awards dot com. Also, that's on. We we said that's on the tenth. That's right. Ten to one thirty. Um, so, come see us. Have come a, see some person. Yeah, nominate somebody. Yeah, you must on. know somebody in the Atlanta area who's doing something really good with supply chain. Come on, no I'll find you somebody. Thanks. That's man. right. <laughs> A uh, couple of the new events real quick. Uh, Auto, uh, Automotive Industry Action Group, their Corporate Responsibility Summit up in Michigan on April 28th and 29th. will be there uh, broadcasting live. The AIAG Supply Chain Summit, also Michigan, June 9th. Great group, AIAG, yep. doing yep. a lot of great uh, stuff in the automotive industry. And then finally, the Association for Manufacturing Excellence is bringing their Atlanta 2020 Lean Summit uh, to town May 4th through the 7th. We'll be there first day interviewing some of their keynotes and some of their participants for that event focused on the world of manufacturing and continuous improvement. Uh, a lot of stuff. So come check, check us out in person. Uh, thanks again to Tevin Taylor with FedEx. What a great uh, day uh, start to the day. Yeah. Right, with this first interview. So you're setting the bar. We, we had um, John – Gold, Gold from NRF. Set the bar yesterday yep. as the leadoff interview, and, and we had three great uh, sessions yesterday. So you're continuing that trend, setting the bar really high. And good before 8 o'clock in the morning, yes. too, by the way. so And he's already in, like, Looking lunch pretty, mode. Yeah, man. I'm impressed. Yes. I'm going to go take a nap here. <laughs> <laughs> so are we. <laughs> That's right. Uh, big thanks to uh, not only our guests, uh, but to our audience for tuning in. Uh, be sure to check out our upcoming events, replays of our interviews, other resources at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. Uh, check us out wherever you get your podcasts from, including YouTube. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. On behalf of the entire team here, Scott Luton and Greg White, wishing you good day. May your elevator conversations always be short and not those awkward long conversations. <laughs> and come check us out. Uh, stay tuned as we continue our live coverage of the Reverse Logistics Association Conference and Expo brought to you today by Re-Commerce Group Industries. Thanks, everybody.